you a bit about my book. Chris did such a good job, I'll forget that part. On the screen in front of you, you can see there's an action called Blue Savannah and Marion versus Ganey. When I, oh, three years ago or more, this is one of the first actions that I read about, but I had no clue where it was. <coughs> Two things came together about a year ago that brought it all out and allowed me to straighten it out. The first thing was Joe Church Dickerson uh, did a lot of research on Blue Savannah to find out where it was, what it was, and read statements uh, from some people that lived in the area. One of them was named Loftus Moonerlin, and you'll see him on the, his, uh, his last name on the 1825 map when we get to it. Uh, and his information is in a pension statement from 1933, uh, 1833 and 1837. And the other thing that helped me figure out the order of these two battles, which by the way, most of the books have both of these things wrong. The order of the battle, who fought, when, and et cetera. So it was uh, Dave Neelan sent me a, a copy of Manning's, uh, one of Marion's letters about a year ago and asked, did I have any idea what he was talking about? And as soon as I read it, there was no doubt in my mind it was Blue Savannah. So without those two things, I'd have never been able to figure out where these things happened. Uh, so the first thing you need to know is Blue Savannah was a Carolina Bay. And for you to understand Carolina Bays, I have a cross section of This is an aerial view of Highway 501 and 41. The crossroads is aerial crossroads. And you can see the three ovals on the north side of 501. Those are Carolina Bays. Nobody knows how they were formed, but it looks as though a meteorite or something like that split apart like it did, like the one did that hit Jupiter and peppered all of South Carolina with these Things. They all run southeast to northwest, and as you can see down in the lower left-hand corner, Blue Savannah is a Carolina Bay. You can't see it very well in this slide, but it's there. So we'll, we'll go to the next one. <coughs> can you see it on that slide, or do you want me to take the pointer and point it out to you? Point it down. I have a central trigger, so I shake. You see that outline? That's, that's Blue Savannah. It got its name because the water in it was all blue. And the, when the wagons would go through it, where Highway 41, the yellow line that goes through it, they would actually ford through the Savannah. And the clay that stuck to the wheels was blue-gray. So that's how it got its name, Blue Savannah. The historical marker, unfortunately, when they uh, made 501 a four-lane highway, they pulled up the historical marker that was at Ariel's Crossroads, where 41 and 501 cross. When they put it back down, they missed the right location by a quarter to three-eighths of a mile. So. If, if you read the historical marker and drive back in the back swamp looking for the place, you'll never find it. And by the way, you don't want to go in there. It's hard to drive. In. This is the letter, a portion of the letter that Dave Neal sent me. And it was dated 9-15-1781. It was from Lieutenant Colonel Francis Marion. He hadn't been yet made a Brigadier General. And this happened shortly after he was put in charge of the forces in South Carolina. And he wrote the letter to Major General Horatio Gates. It says on the 25th of August, he sent the Continentals to Wilmington. He also wrote a letter that I don't have here 
dated the 29th of April, and he mailed that from the north side of Ports Ferry. So Marion was at Ports Ferry when he left to go meet the Tories coming at him. And you can see on the third instant, he received information that 200 Tories intended to attack him at Ports Ferry. So being a good uh, tactician, he decided I'm not going to wait. He immediately mustered 52 men, which is all he could raise, and set out going north up Ports Ferry Road to meet him and catch him by surprise. When he got to Blue Savannah, he found 45 men, and if, if you read in there, he killed or wounded 30 of the 45. The other 15 escaped, probably in the back swamp, which is what one reference says. Back swamp is the, the swamp on either side of the Little, Inch, the, uh, little PD River. And then it says, he, he just took them for the main body and discovered they weren't. So he continued north up Highway 41 for three miles. And then he met the 200 Tories coming at him in full march. His 52 men charged them so fiercely, they, he scared the dickens out of them and they all scattered into the swamp. And you can see the last line under the red uh, says they got into an impassable swamp all, to all but Tories. <laughs> in the action, uh, well, maybe we're getting too far ahead. In the action, he lost one man in the first, he lost one man in the first action that was wounded. In the second action, <coughs> Uh, the Tories didn't suffer any casualties, but uh, Marion had three wounded and had two horses killed. But he, he scattered them so badly and scared them so badly they didn't come back at him for a while. After that, he retreated back to Port Ferry and built a redoubt on the north side. I've got some friends in uh, Johnsonville and Hemingway that are looking to try to find that read it. But it's kind of difficult because in the winter when the snakes aren't there, the hot river's high. So they either are having to fight floodwaters or they're having to fight snakes. So they're trying to find a time when neither one is going to be a problem. Uh, this is the historical marker for Port Sperry. It's about a mile on the right hand side going north toward Florence from Johnsonville. It's on the far corner of a road that turns to the right. And that road does go to the south side of Ports Ferry, but it's on private property. And the last two or three miles that you drive, if you're going out that way, you better do it in four wheel drive because the sand is about a foot deep. A good chance you'll get stuck. But Francis Marion used that ferry quite a bit during the 1780s. This is a historical marker for Blue Savannah. It's on Highway 501, and on one of the next maps, you'll see where it's located. Now, it used to be <coughs> at Ariel's Crossroads, and one quarter of a mile south would be where Blue Savannah is if they'd have put it back in the right place, but they didn't. So I spent a lot of time driving around in back swamp trying to figure out where Blue Savannah was. Uh, that was before that Dave and Joe Church Dickerson helped me out of it. So I believe there are four mistakes on this historical marker. Number one, it's in the wrong place. Number two, it says he defeated a band of Tories under Captain Barfield. In Joe Church Dickerson's research, the name Barfield was never mentioned, so that's not correct. One of the residents that was living in that area at that time said that two men, one named Walls and one man named Lewis, were the leaders of that band of 45 that uh, Marion attacked first. And the, 
the other mistake I think it is not right. It says he feigned a retreat and drew them into a ambush. He got he got word of the Tories coming at him on the third. The next day he left after he rounded up 52 men. So I think probably he didn't get off or leave Port Sperry until maybe five or six in the morning. Uh, it's 15 miles to Blue Savannah. So if they were walking their horses, which I doubt, it would take them five hours to get there. More than likely they were going not at a full gallop, but somewhere in between. So I figured about five hours, uh, five miles to the hour. You divide that into 15, it would take him about three hours to get there. And his letter says that in the morning of the 4th, or on the morning of the 4th. So I think he arrived at Blue Savannah sometime between 8 and 10, right around 9 o'clock. Uh, they may have been up, but were probably still camped at, at the Savannah. I doubt that Marion would have had time to set up an ambush send men out and get them to chase him back. It's possible, but I, it's, to me it doesn't sound very probable. So I really doubt that he led them into an ambush. The other thing, this is a, the 1825 map. And, oops, right there, you can see the last name of, of Munerland, and the L must be for Loftus. He owned the land where Blue Savannah is. The vertical road is Highway 41. The one going or almost horizontal is Highway 501 as it was shaped before they remade it into a four lane. And Aerial Crossroads is right there where it says MH, which stands for Meeting House. Uh, Everything to the right over to the river is considered now as being back swamp. It's not real swampy. Um, right now, now it's been deep ditched on each side of each dirt road, which is a one lane road in there, and they kind of make a checkerboard to drain it. So the land is dry, but the ditches are 10 to 12 feet deep. So if you decide to drive around back in there, be careful, especially when you're turning around it'll bury your car. Uh, and then Marion stated he continued three miles further on and between Blue Savannah and the square where Marion meets Ganey is three miles. Gapway, if you're familiar with that road, Highway 41 going up that way, Gapway is now is a church and just a couple of houses. It's not very big. That's, that's where Gapway is. So it happened about halfway between 501 and Gapway. <coughs> and that's where he met the 200. Most of the books say he met the 200 first and then did Savannah, the Blue Savannah. That's backwards. Just Marion's letters straight out the border of that. So Joe Church told me where it was and Dave Nealon's letter told me the order that it happened. And I've got a few other slides here maybe that will help you. This is the modern map. Port Ferry is down at the bottom and the old Port Ferry Road is that black line that went over to Peters Ferry. Peters Ferry is right there. So I think Marion took this route up and then 41 up and took the right hand fork at Centenary to get to Blue Savannah. From there, he marched three miles north. Uh, Ganey was, uh, his territory was the upper PD. And he, I'm sure if you've all been in the revolution very long, you know he was one of the main opponents of Marion. And Barfield was too. But Barfield was never mentioned in any of the original documents as being at Blue Savannah. This again is the modern map, but here you can see where the historical marker is. It's here, it should be over there. And when you go a quarter of a mile south 
from where they have put the historical marker, it puts you in the middle back <coughs> there. And that's not a place you're going to drive around to. I try it. Uh, it's too bad they didn't put it back where it belongs. At least people would have been able to go down Highway 41 and if they knocked on the door to people tell them where it was. So, uh, and you can see I measured from Blue Savannah up, it says 2.97 miles, I figured that was close enough to three. So that's where it happened. It may have actually happened where that other road comes in just north of where I have the square. That's the end of Blue Savannah. If you have any questions on that one before I start the next one, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Yes, sir? Is there a problem to uh, seeking to have the historical marker relocated? I don't know. I look for places where people were killed and houses were burned and churches were burned. I don't, I don't do the historical marker thing. And most of the most of the actions, it, there are over 400 sites in the book I wrote. Uh, that's more than any other state. Out of all of those 400, if 10% have historical markers, we're lucky. And unfortunately, since aluminum has become so expensive, some people are stealing historical markers or breaking the top saw of a $2,000 sign to sell it for five or six bucks worth of aluminum. A good case in point is the historical marker that was at Halfway Swamp, which is just right over there. I was fortunate enough to get a picture of that before it got stolen. So if any of you would like a copy of that, I mean a photo of that historical marker, send me an email. I've got cards out there, and I'd be happy to send you a picture of it. Yes, sir? The historical marker at this time next week will be back in place. Oh, great. And by the way, if you've never been to, have, to that uh, Elias Mill Pond, that's one of the prettiest sights in the middle of the winter when the sky is pure blue, cypress trees growing up through it. It's just one of the prettiest sights in the whole state. And I really encourage you to go see that. And if you walk behind, the mill house is on one side, the pond is on the other side. The spillway is still there. And if you walk behind the building, the mill building, and look down, the millstones are on the side of the creek down there. Any other questions? Okay. okay. Yes, sir. Um, I know the first action we always call Blue Savannah. Does the second action have a name that was it was called historically, or do you ever, or is it just all rolled together in Blue Savannah? Not that I know of. Most of the books that I've read say. He took on Gaines first and then went to Blue Savannah. <clears throat> and I mean, the, these are well known historical books that a lot of people use for reference. But Miriam's letter got to trump all of those because it was written two weeks after the action, not 20 years or 30 or 40 years. <clears throat> and uh, thanks, Dave. You really helped me straighten this one out. Because I'd been thinking about this action for three years and I could not figure out where it was. Most of them said it just happened just north of Port Spirit. Well, 15 miles is just north, but I thought it was closer to the ferry than it actually turned out to be. And uh, Joe Church said she was going to publish her work on Finding Blue Savannah. To my knowledge, she still hasn't done so, but she did give me permission to use her work in my book, as long as I gave her credit, which I did. You ready to go on to the next one? Yep. This is another one that was lost to history, as far as I know, up until early 1900s, 1909. It was passed down as tradition from family to family to family since the revolution. Uh, there was an article published in one of the newspapers in 1909 that gave a description of this action. Most of the books, again, say that af after the uh, action with uh, between Marion's men, now Marion was down in Georgia, uh, Georgetown, so, but after Snow's Island and the action with Marion's men at Witherspoon's Ferry, Marion's men did not follow Doyle. Doyle got called back to camp. 
but that's not true. He did, they did follow him as far as Willow Grove. And we'll get into that now and I'll show you what he follows him. This is a map with the Three Bridges campaign on it, where Marion attacked uh, Watson and I, I don't remember his name, it's Tadwell Watson, Tadwell Watson, or something like that. And, but he was British. At Waibu Swamp, that's over on the left hand side, lower left hand corner. And the date is 3 6 that that action happened. Then Doyle started chasing Marion across over to Mount Hope Swamp Bridge. That one was on 3 9. That action happened. Marion destroyed the bridge to slow Watson down. Marion then went over to the lower bridge south of King Street. And at that action, McCultry's rifles, and there's somebody here that's related to McCultry's, uh, shot at the British. The, the Americans were on the north side, the British were on the south side. They couldn't cross the river, couldn't take the bridge because of McCultry's <coughs> And the uh, references say that the cannon that the British had could not be depressed low enough to shoot at the riflemen on the other bank. They were just killing the tops of the trees, blowing the tops out of trees. <clears throat> As a result, uh, Watson withdrew to Witherspoon's plantation. The 1825 map has two Witherspoon's plantations on it. One, uh, one is right in there, and the other one is over here. On this map, I chose the one furthest away because the riflemen, Marion's riflemen, were harassing him. They were shooting at the camp. A Sergeant McDonald climbed a tree and at 300 yards shot the knee out from under a British officer. So they were being harassed there. And they had to move down to Blakely's plantation, which is in the lower right-hand corner. They had to do that because Marion somehow got some men on the other side of Witherspoon's Ferry. And there's, there's a bridge right there. They destroyed that bridge. So Watson could not go down that road to get to Georgetown. He had to come through the swamps, and there had to be a road there because he had cannon with down to Blakely's plantation. <clears throat> and since there was a plantation there, there had to be a road too. He came all the way down to the river road on the Santee River. That's this lower road that ends there near, near Gordon. And he took that road into Georgetown and his men uh, ran into Yeah, he ran into Horry at Sam Pitt Bridge, and that was the Battle of Sam Pitt Bridge. Marion was coming up behind and was, was going to uh, attack him from the other side, but the British had cannon, and uh, Marion couldn't fight the cannon, so he gave up there. That happened on the 20th of March, and this talk is not about that, but that's a brief account of what happened. Marion was down in Georgetown on the 20th. He learned of his camp on Snow's Island being attacked by Doyle when he was in Georgetown. This is an 1825 map, kind of stylized so it would all fit on one screen. You can see where Snow's Island is. Doyle destroyed Marion's camp on Snow's Island, came across and went up to Witherspoon's Ferry, crossed the ferry, and burned the ferry so that Marion's men, now Marion wasn't with them, but some of his men were chasing Doyle. They had a, a rifle duel across the river, and it must have been Doyle's rear guard that did that. But because they burned the ferry, Marion couldn't cross. And the textbooks say he had to go five miles for a place to find a place to ford the river, the uh, Lynch's Creek. And most of the books say he did not follow them. But this story tells you that he did. 
when I measured with the scale on this 1825 map, five miles up the creek, it came out. Oops. Hit the wrong button. You can see a dashed line right there. That's a dashed line that's on the 1825 map, and it goes to Captain Stone's house. There were two Captain Stones listed in Dr. Bobby Moss's book. And if you'll give me a minute, I'll find their names. Because all of this hasn't been followed in my notes. Doyle went back, was going back to Camden, as he, he was recalled back. And this is shortly before the Battle of Hopkirk's Hill. So that's probably why he was called back. And on this map, there's 25 miles. This was a 50 mile chase. There's 25 miles of map missing in the upper left hand corner of the right hand map. It was just a road that kept the same angle going northwest. So to fit everything on one screen, I cut that out and hooked these two together. But in the lower left-hand corner, it crossed Williamsburg, Mary, Darlington, and Sumter counties. So it, it was a long chase. And, uh, okay, the two stones, one was named Austin, spe spelled with an O-N, and the other one was William Stone. Both served under Marion. And I don't know which one lived here, but it's probably one of those two. <coughs> Excuse me. The dashed line tells me that there had to be a ford there. Otherwise, they wouldn't have put the dashed line in. There was some special feature there that went across. And they forded the river five miles up, and that's exactly where that dashed line is. So that had to be where they forded the river. And now, uh, Marion's men are chasing Doyle. <clears throat> Doyle is the red arrows, Marion is the blue. For 50 miles. This is a close-up of Snow's Island and where the ferry is, how Doyle went across and continued on toward Camden, where Marion had to stay on the south side of Lynch's Creek until they could find the ford. And again, there's the dashed line going to Captain Stone's. This is the end of that chase, but there was 25 miles between those two maps that were at the, the creek and the road were going at the same angle northwest, so I cut them out. Uh, the reason on the left-hand map that there's, it looks like two different rivers <coughs> or creeks, uh, these were two different Mills Atlas maps that were married together and they were drawn by different people, so they don't match exactly. But you can see they were pretty close, even though they were drawn separately. So they came, the road comes back down south, and there's a bridge there called Jones Bridge. They both crossed Jones Bridge. Doyle stayed on the north side of a creek called Big Branch, and Marion stayed on the south side of that creek called Big Branch. And there you can see it a little bit closer with the bridge. And Big Branch I had to draw in because it's not shown on this map. This is a close-up of Willow Grove. The modern name for Willow Grove is Lynchburg. Doyle, there was a log cabin where you see the circle for, with next to the word Mary. It was a run distillery an old rum distillery. And the Americans took position in and around that old cabin. Doyle was on the other side of Big Branch. And I've got a yellow mark there. It could have been where the Y is in Doyle, but somewhere on that side between the two roads. The battle took place in the afternoon. And you know, got to look at my notes because I forgot the date. Yet yeah, Noel's not fun. Okay, it, it was 
4, 5, 1781. And they fought in the afternoon until nightfall. All the firing and shooting stopped at nightfall. Uh, and the next morning when the Americans woke up to resume the fight, the English had left during the night uh, and gone to, on their way to Camden. The, uh, when I went to Lynchburg, I stopped at a, whoops, right about there is a hardware store and a kind of a mom and pop store. <coughs> I stopped and knocked on the, went in and asked him if they had any idea where this happened. The man walked me over to his front door and he said, yeah, he said, see that white house over there? That's where the log cabin was. See those trees back there? That's Big Branch. So it, everybody there knows what happened. I don't think there's a historical marker for this. The first account that I'm aware of was in the 1909 newspaper. It was written by someone that grew up in Lynchburg, and he said when they were kids, and this was 1909, so when he was a kid, he was probably in his 40s then. So he, he was alive during the Civil War. He said when we were kids, we used to go over to that log house or cabin that was still standing there, and we would pry the British and lead shot out of the building, pound it flat, cut it into squares, and use it in our shotguns to hunt rabbits and squirrels. I first learned of this action by accident. I was at Singleton's Mill, or Poinsett Park, and the head ranger gave me a little excerpt of a few books. One of them was the history of Sumter County. And in those few pages she gave me, it mentioned this action and it gave the reference. So I wrote to the archives, got a copy of the reference, which was about a 1928 or 1929 agricultural study of Sumter and Lee counties, along with economics and population and that kind of thing. And the same story that was uh, word for word that was in the 1909 paper was in that little uh, agricultural report. And it got picked up from there and put into the history of Sumter County. Those are the only three places that I know it appears. So, and, uh, in that account, he said they had no trouble following Doyle because he was in such a rush to get to Camden. He was, they were discarding their heavy equipment. So all Marion's men had to do was follow the junk along the road. It was like breadcrumbs. And they caught them at, at Willow Grove, which is now modern Lynchburg. And that's the end of that one, I think. Yep. There's one other thing. I missed a slide on this first presentation. It's this one. This is the cross section of a Carolina Bay. It's they, whatever hit the earth and made those big ovals threw up a sand ridge all the way around it. That's why they looked like footballs in the other slide that you saw. And they'll be full of water. Their sand deposits form the ridge. And underneath that is pebble and gravel deposits. And I'm going to show you the next slide. Now you can understand better why you see white rings. That's the sand rim of the Carolina Bays. And on that next one, you can still, even after all these years of being plowed and drained and everything else, you can still see the flattened out sand rim of Blue Savannah. And it's just south of Aerial Crossroads, about a quarter of a mile. So, if you have any questions, yes, please. It's a question, Jack. First, the, uh, this chase, when did it begin? You said the battle was on the 5th of April. When did it when uh, the chase begin? I'd have to look it up in my book. I don't think I wrote it down. Let me look at my notes here real quick. What are you looking for, Jeff? Oh, Witherspoon's Ferry. Who's the command of Ferry?
Uh, Doyle destroyed, destroyed Marion's camp on 329, 1781. Witherspoon's Ferry happened on 4-3, 1781. So the chase started on 4-3, 1781. And it took him about two days to get to Willow Grove or Lynchburg for that 50-mile chase. So and they, they were moving quickly. Doyle wanted to get back to camp. He had orders to get back to camp. So two days is, is reasonable for fast-moving troops. Either they're being chased and having to get someplace, probably by a certain day. Uh, after this, after uh, Willow Grove, Marion's men did not follow Doyle any further. Instead, Marion collected his men and they went to Fort Watson and had, the, I think that was the date that they had the siege of Fort Watson. Any other questions? Question. Yes, sir. Uh, these, these locations in Sundar, are they in your book? Uh, Savannah, the Battle of Blue Savannah is in my book, and I went back and looked at it. As far as I know, it's correct, because I got these letters before I printed the book. Uh, Willow Grove is also correct, because I had that information before I printed the book. And one other thing I'd like to tell you, if, if you have a copy of my book, I didn't have a website when the first ones were getting sold. I now have a website, and uh, if you want me to, I can give you the web address or pick up a card. It's on my cards. But when I find a better location, more accurate, or a better text on any of the pages in the book, I rewrite them and post them online so that you can print them and add them to your book and have the latest information. And as you might guess, this is an ongoing work. I'll probably be dead before it's finished. <laughs> If you know of any new locations, battles, skirmishes, or murders, church or house burnings, let me know, and I'll put them in the next edition. If you know of a better location, more accurate, than the one I have in the book, let me know, and I'll correct the page, rewrite it, and put it online. Any other questions? Yes, sir? Have you located Payne's Plantation? That's a location that's often mentioned. Whose plantation? Payne's Plantation. That's mentioned in a number of books as being a favorite title of Francis Marion. Uh, no, I haven't. And I haven't given any, any time really to hide out cemeteries, things like that. I was interested in where people got killed or buildings were burned, important buildings. Uh, like Charles Baxley wanted me to unravel what happened to the battle, around the Battle of Port Sperry. And it turned out there was two or three things that happened that I didn't know about until he pushed me to dig into it. And I found some more actions there that are not in the book. Uh, a lot of the meeting houses, churches were burned because, well, Indian Town. And that was one of the reasons Marion did not want Watson to cross the Little Inches River at the Lower Bridge because it would give him access to Indian Town, Snow's Island, and Marion's home territory. The church uh, at Indian Town was burned. And uh, it, at the time, the guy that burned it was either way, I think it was Wayless. He said it's a sedition shop. And that's where the Patriots got together to plan what they were going to do and talk about politics. Most of the Episcopal churches and the Presbyterian churches were on the Patriot side. Most of the Baptist churches and other denominations were on the Tory side. And you all know that Tory has supported the British and the Whigs supported the Americans. So the plantation you ask about, I don't know where it is. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, the men that Marion had with him on these actions, were they considered uh, militiamen? Yes. He, he really hadn't gotten into being regular 
army in regular kind of tactics until later in his career. This, these were all volunteers that, that went with him. Like uh, the Battle of Savannah, he said he could only muster 52 men. Well, normally a commander would say, I'm crazy if I put 52 against 200. But Marion went for it. He didn't sit back and wait for the battle to come to him. He went after it. And as a result, he surprised them. They didn't expect him to be coming. And they, he scared them all away. Did I digress a little bit? But one of the Patriot commanders wanted to increase his force with volunteers. So he confiscated a, a barrel of rum from a Tory. And he managed to get all the local guys drunk and signed them up. And off they went. This, this was down in Fairfield County, Jenkins Crossroads. Off they went, full of liquid courage, and they were so drunk they could hardly stand on their horses, and anything they had with them that they could put whiskey in, they took with them. They're riding down the road, and they ran in, into some British troops, and they started yelling, there they are, boys, let's get them. They scared the British so bad, the British ran away. Not a shot was fired. Uh, sorry about that. That didn't happen to close to here, where we married. Any other questions? Yes, I'm saying.